There is sunshine in my soul today. More glorious and bright glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine. Happy moments roll when Jesus shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. A carol to my King. And Jesus listening in can hear. The songs I cannot sing Oh, the sunshine, blessed sun Shine when the peaceful, happy moments roll When Jesus shows his smiling face There is sunshine in my soul there is springtime in my soul today For when the Lord is near The dove of peace sings in my heart The flowers of grace appear Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine when the peaceful, happy moments roll When Jesus shows his smiling face There is sunshine in the soul There is gladness in my soul today And hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now For joys laid up above Oh, the sunshine, blessed sun Shine when the peaceful, happy moments roll When Jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in the soul. Amen. Our opening song today is number 248. 248. And if you would please stand. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, oh, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. Oh, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus, singing, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Oh, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who, when its sorrow bears apart, 
that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, singing, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus, singing, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. long time no see. So today I'm going to be sharing a couple songs with you. Um, just kind of a little throwback to our times together before. Um, but this one is called The Commission. See my hands and look at my feet. It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith you will do greater things It's my time to go But before I leave Go tell the world about me I was dead much to do here before you leave. Go tell the world about me. I was dead and now I live. I've got to go now for a little while. But goodbye is not the Like you've never known 
but things change when you're down in the valley don't lose faith for you've never alone under God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times is still God in the bad times the God on the day is still God in the night you talk of faith when you're up on the mountain but talk too easy when life has at best but now in the valley of trials and temptations that's where your faith it's really put to the test and the God on the mountain is the God in the valley when things go wrong He'll make them right And the God of the good time Is the God in the bad times The God on the day Is the God in the night The God on the day is to God in the night. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It is a privilege to be back. Love the weather right now. It's perfect outside. I've been on quite the adventure since I left you guys. I had two other uh, seminars that I... Uh, proceeded to do after I finished here in Ojai, went back to Arizona, finished teaching at the Bible College, Souls West. I'm officially resigned. I'm officially freelance, you know, officially just free to go where the Lord leads. And so I'll be living in Redlands now, Redlands, California, here in Southern Cal. So I'm excited to be relocating back to California. And I'll just be working part-time doing my own side business out there um, while I'm pursuing medical school still. And so I'm excited again for how the Lord has led. He's blessed in many ways. I'm sure he's blessed you in many ways since I've been here. And I hope that you've come with a desire to learn. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. And then we're going to dive into our presentation today. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege we have to come and to study your word. We ask that your spirit would be here to lead, guide, and inspire us, I pray. As we talk about the talents and the parable of the talents, I pray that we would see them in a new light, from a new perspective, in a new way, in Christ's name, amen. amen. Today's presentation is entitled, Beyond Talent, and as you can imagine, it is based on the parable of the talents. Now, I know many of you have probably read or heard a sermon on the talents before, and I want you to go ahead and not check out, amen. Amen. I know as soon as the, the, the presenter begins and we know the content, trust me, our brains check out. I'm working through a series of seminars right now, and two, I, li- I love theology and I love science. Both were repeats yesterday. I was um, going through a seminar on uh, hermeneutics of scripture, and as soon as the guy began, I knew exactly what he was going to talk about for the next hour and a half, but that was okay. I had to choose not to check out, Amen. I had to choose to stay engaged because even when it's content we are familiar with, there is often something new that the Lord still has in store for us. And so we will be talking about this parable today, but we're going to build up some context first. See, Matthew 24, verse 3 says this, And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, 
the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what, when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Matthew 24 is a powerful chapter. You're probably very familiar with this chapter, known as the signs of the times, correct? Uh, we talk about the pestilence and the wars and the rumors of wars and things of this nature. Often evangelists will cover this, uh, this chapter to show, show that we do indeed live in strange and unusual times in relation to the things that were predicted before the end of the world. Um, however, I want to show you something special about this section that you may not have noticed in the Bible before. Here the disciples are asking a question and then Jesus answers this question in Matthew 24. And the red letters, this is just a screenshot from my Bible, my online Bible software program. You'll notice the red letters are the words of Jesus. So this is his answer. Verse three, or excuse me, verse four says, and Jesus answered and said to them, and then he begins to answer their question. What will it be like at the end of the world? And what will it be like when you return? Those are the questions that they ask. When will this happen? What will it be like? Jesus begins to answer. That's chapter 24, verse 4 through 25. If you continue looking in Matthew chapter 24, what you'll notice is verse 26 through 46, it's still what color? So who's still speaking? He hasn't even taken a break yet. This is still answering the same question. You continue reading, you go from chapter 24 to chapter 25, verse 1. Notice it's still what color? That means chapter 25, and this is fundamentally important, is still answering the question, what will it be like when you return? What will it be like at the end of the world? Most of the time as uh, students or preachers, what we do is we look at Matthew 24 in an isolated way, that that is about the end of the world, and Matthew 25 has three cute parables that are fun to read. But those cute, precious parables in Matthew 25 are so important because those three parables are still answering the same question. What will it be like at the end of the world? What will it be like when you return? We must study these parables in this context. In fact, I'll show you the rest of chapter 25. It's read the entire way through. Jesus never took a break. So what are the three parables? You may be familiar with some of these. You have the parable, the wise and the foolish version, the parable, the talents, and the sheep and the goats. These are the three parables of Matthew 25. All three parables are describing a certain condition. I'm going to suggest to you what it is. I don't have time to go into the great details of the whole thing. I'm going to suggest it to you, and hopefully in your own studies, you can go look at it for yourself. But Matthew 25 is actually describing the condition of the church, professed Christians, before Jesus returns. See, Matthew 24 is all about the signs in the world. Matthew 25 is the sign in the, in the church. And this is very important to understand because when you meet, read Matthew 25, if you find yourself a foolish, not wise virgin, that's not a good thing, amen? If you find yourself a, a goat, you know, I was called a goat a lot when I was younger. Goat, stubborn, right? If you find yourself a goat and not a sheep, by description, it's probably not a good thing. If you find yourself uh, the person who did not use their talents, it's probably not a good thing. These are describing conditions of the church and it gives us some, some remedies if we find ourselves in these conditions. Again, time doesn't allow. A proper seminar would go through all three of these and show their interconnection and bring a full picture out. You will have to do that in your own studies. If you don't know how to do that comfortably with your Bible, I recommend a book called Christ Object Lessons. Um, Christ Object Lessons has a chapter, uh, it's, a, it's about 30 chapters in the book. Um, there's a chapter dedicated to each of these subjects within that book. I highly recommend you read that book if you find yourself having a difficult time studying the parables of Jesus for yourself. Beautiful book centered on the grace and love of God. I agree with the author principally and fundamentally in their view of scripture and of Christ and the plan of salvation. And so I highly would recommend you read that book to understand these parables more deeply for yourself. Okay, so let's begin. We're going to begin. We're going to be studying Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. 
This is the section of text we're going to be studying primarily. And again, we're still building our context before we dive into the, the main meat of the parable itself. So we're going to begin in Matthew 25, verse 14. I invite you to open your Bibles and follow along if you have them. Uh, I still stand by what I said last time I was here. The last person you should ever trust is a, is a preacher. Uh, when it comes to things that pertain to salvation and eternal life, these are things you should open your Bible and study for yourself. You should know these things for yourself. So Matthew 25, verse 14. Screen, uh, most of the verses will be on the screen for ease. But again, I encourage you to track with me if you have your Bibles. So Matthew 25, verse 14, is where many, many um, commentators start the parable of the talents. This is where most commentators start the parable of the talents. And the Bible says here, uh, King James, New King James Version says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, if you're um, new to... uh, studying the Bible and looking at the King James and the New King James translations, particularly the King James translations, um, and I believe the New American Standard Bible, you'll notice italicized words. Have you ever noticed italicized words in your Bibles? It's, yeah, right? Those italicized, it's like, I remember when I first, when I was an atheist becoming a Christian, and I started reading the Bible, I was like, what the weird format is this? Why are there random italicized words all over the Bible? Uh, it didn't quite make sense to me. What I learned later on is the reason why there are italicized words is those words are not in the original text, the original Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic manuscripts, and they were supplemented to help with the reading of the, of the, of the text. If, if uh, you speak more than uh, two languages, any, any bilingual or trilingual in the room? Okay, a few. Uh, when you translate from like Spanish to English, is it just a word-for-word translation? No, if you've ever tried that, it does not work. It makes no sense. Um, In fact, I actually have a literal translation of the Greek Testament, and I will tell you what, it almost makes no sense because of the, the word, the formatting is very different than the English language. Why do I say all this? The phrase, the kingdom of heaven, is in italics. It's in italics, which means that phraseology is actually not in the original text. So it should read, for it is like a man. And many modern translations will translate it this way, for it is like a man. But then the question is, what is the, what is the it? What is the it that it's referring to? We have to go back one verse to verse 13. This is where I believe the parable of the talents truly begins, because it's the it. The Bible says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour, for it will be like. What is the it? The day and the hour when Jesus will return. See, the parable of the talents are so important, my friends. They are so important because they help us to see, to identify, to know the condition of what it will be like before Jesus returns. And that's why, to me, these, these, these are a very, very important subject to study. And that's the context. So as we study them today, let's keep this context in mind. Jesus is answering that question, and even in the direct context, it is referring to the day when Christ returns. So we're going to look at three points today. Our first point, we're going to see that talents are gifts from God. They're gifts from God, but they might be different than what you might be thinking when you hear the word talent. The second thing we're going to see is talents are supposed to be cultivated. Talents are supposed to be cultivated. And the third thing is God holds us accountable for the use of our talents. These are the three things we're going to look at. They're gifts from God. They are to be cultivated. And God holds us accountable for how we use the gifts which he has so graciously given us. So let's go into it. First point. Our talents come from God. Here we go. The Bible says... Matthew 25, verse 14. For it, as we mentioned earlier, the it, uh, referring to the second coming of Jesus, is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Okay, so we have a couple of characters. We have the man traveling to the far country, we have, and we have the servants. What does the man traveling give the servants? It's okay, you give me feedback, it's okay. 
What does he give the servants? According to the text, use the language of the Bible. His goods. So who do the goods belong to? Yeah, the man traveling, right? So the goods belong to the man traveling. Do the goods belong to the servants? No, they're just receiving what the, we'll just call him the Lord, since he's the guy that's in charge. The Lord, they just have what he's given them, correct? But it's not inherently their, their own. The Bible goes on to read in Matthew chapter 25. Oops, my phone just shut off. Let me just turn that back on real quick. All right. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So did everyone receive the same amount of talents? No. no. So the Lord gave goods to servants, and these goods were called talents. Now, some, one person got five, another person got two, another person got one. So did everyone receive the same amount of talents? No. no. Now, talent in the original language is a sum of money, but that's okay for now. We're just going to call it his goods, his goods. Um, how would you feel if you were the guy with one talent and you, and you were standing next to the guy that got five talents? If the, if the Lord said, hey, guess what? Here's five talents, five sacks of goods. Hey, you, here's two, and oh, and you, here's one. How many of you would naturally, maybe naturally, kind of be like, hey, how come I didn't get five talents? Anyone might, might feel that way? Okay, sure, right? Let's just be honest. Sure, right? Okay, why did I not? Well, what does the text say? To each one what? According to his own ability. You see, when we look at this question about how many talents do we receive, how many talents do we receive, the Bible gives a very interesting clarifying statement. It is according to his own ability. A very famous Bible promise, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13, teaches that God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. Is that good news? That is good news. That is great news. But did you know the antithesis or the opposite is equally true? God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle, but God will also not bless you beyond what you can handle. Did you know that there is a limit to how many blessings it's probably safe to give you? Let me give an illustration. When I was a brand new Christian, I think I shared the story last time I was here. Um, one of my very first prayers, aside from hi, my introduction to God, one of my first prayers where I ask for something. I read, if you ask, you will receive. And I said, okay, I believe in this God thing. Let me try this God thing out. Let me get on my knees and ask. I said, hey, God, I want a Ferrari. I'm a street racer. I like to win races. A Ferrari would be really helpful right about now. And so I have a 1987 Corolla, very far from a Ferrari. It's the exact opposite of a Ferrari. Um, and so I was like, please, Lord, make, give me a Ferrari. And I prayed this prayer. And I went outside to see if my 1987 Corolla morphed into a Ferrari. And guess what? No, it didn't. It did not. Now question, I was addicted to street racing. Street racing was my God. It was my idol. It was my life. It was my everything. And yes, it was highly illegal. Question, it, was I safe to give a Ferrari? Was I safe to put behind the wheel of a Ferrari? In that prayer, I even asked God, Lord, just let me drive a Ferrari. Never have. I was oh, okay, okay, that's fine. I'll tell you what, I was literally not safe to bless with that, that prayer. Ironically enough, about eight years later, I get a phone call and someone says, hey, you want to you drive a Ferrari? And I said, are you kidding me? Like, out of nowhere, literally, I was coming, walking out of class and it's like, hey, you want to drive a Ferrari? I'm like, D address, address now, right? And he was like, hey, do you want to street race it? And I was like, no, I don't do that anymore. My, my, my heart has changed. Amen? But it was, it was, you know, God will not bless you beyond what you can handle, so what is a talent? A talent is any gift from God. It's any good, anything that is given to you that is not naturally, inherently yours. It's a gift from God. Not everyone has the same amount of these gifts. Some of them, we all have. What is a gift from God? Question, is health a gift from God? Amen. Health is a gift from God. Therefore, health is a talent. Did you know you're a talented person? See, when I say talent, immediately most of you probably thought like the, you know, we were blessed with a couple special musics today and guitar player today. And you're thinking, wow, these people have, man, they got talent. 
They got talent. But you're talented. Is muscle function a talent? Is that a gift from God, the fact that you can actually be mobile and move? Yeah. Does it take muscles to smile? How many of you can smile? Let me see some smiles. Y'all look so serious today. Did you know the ability to smile is a talent? How many of you are still clearly alive? That means you have time. Is time a gift from God? Time is a talent then. Any good from God is a talent. You are more talented than you actually thought possible. How many of you have an opposable thumb? You're talented. Any gift that God has given you literally is a talent. Some of us have more than others, but we all have something that God has given us. Therefore, we are all talented people. We are full of talent. However, we're not supposed to just be content with the talents we inherently have. We are commanded, we are admonished to cultivate new talents. The Bible says, Then he who had to receive five talents went and traded with them and made what? Another five. So notice this. Five came from God. Five were gifts. But then five were, like, yeah, the result of investment, the result of cultivation. This person took what was given to him, put those things to work, and actually made five more. The Bible goes on to say, And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. And so what we see here is this idea that they multiply their talents. So let me give you a tangible example. I have the ability to walk. I consider that a talent. I have relatives that can't walk. So I consider it a gift from God to be able to walk. I can talk. I can smile nervously sometimes, but I can still pull it off. I have an opposable thumb to hold on to something, and I can have an arm to put that thing out. So I, and I have a brain that's capable of memorizing re- things that I repeat over and over and over again. These are all natural, inherent things that I have. So what I decided to do with these natural, inherent talents is I decided to sign up for this program called Youth Rush, a literature adventures and program where you go door to door, you knock on doors, and you share Christian literature with the community. Talents I did not have. I was not a good speaker. I did not have boldness. <laughs> Um, and a bunch of other things. So I still remember, I decided to go and do this because I had the basics, but there were so many things I lacked. The first door I knocked on, I met this lady, and I still remember her face. And I went to share the book. Now, they teach you what to say, so it's supposed to be easy. Like, you're supposed to just memorize what to say. You're supposed to just say it, and people are supposed to get books from you. That's supposed to be how it works. But in training... The, it begins with, hi, my name is, and then there's a blank line. And that's where you put your name in, right? Well, the trainers don't want you to put your name in during training because everyone has a different name. It doesn't sound smooth. They want us all to say it at the same time together. So we all just say the word blank. Hi, my name is blank. We're students working on a scholarship, blah, 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 blah. So I get to the door, knock on the door. I meet the, my very first lady ever doing this. Hi, my name is Blank. blank. That's all that came to my mind. I drilled it so well, like it was locked in, right? I didn't even have the capability in the moment to say my name. Hi, my name is blank. It was such an epic, fi- I was so, bar- I literally wanted to die of embarrassment. Because a lady asked me, what's your name? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I gave her a book, I, or I didn't give it to her, I stuck a book out and I said, do you want to buy it for $20? That's all I said. Didn't even say what the book was about. Said, hey, I got a book. It's $20. We don't buy it. She said, no. I said, buy. And I walked away. I went to the curb. And I remembered like the story of Ezekiel where God grabbed him by the lock of his hair and like relocated him. And so I stuck my hands in the air. And I said, God, pick me up and take me home. Because I was in a whole other part of the state. And I was like, just pick me up, take me home. And I stood there on the curb for like 10 minutes or so with my arms in the air waiting to, to go. My leader actually drove by. He told me later, he's like, I was like, what in the world is Anthony doing? He's just standing there on the curb. And uh, I opened my eyes, and I was still there in San Jose, California. I didn't go anywhere. So I said, hey, look, I guess I'm going to stick this thing out. If God, God had the capability to move me if he wanted to move me, 
clearly that didn't happen. So I'm just going to keep knocking on these doors. I was so shy. My friends, I was so painfully shy at this time in my life. I remember my first church potluck I went to. I went to the potluck. I grabbed my food. Everyone was sitting at the tables. I went and sat at a table in the far corner by myself. Someone had the audacity to come sit next to me to try to talk with me. I said, oh, I'm going to get some more rice. I got up, got rice, and I walked outside and ate outside on the curb. Like, I was like, I'm not going back to that table because they sat next to me, and I don't want to talk to them. Like, I was so painfully shy. I could not have gotten in stage in front of a group like this. I would have died back then. I literally would have died. In fact, the first time I attempted to get up in front, I just felt myself stuttering the whole time. It, was hard, it felt hard to push words out of my mouth. I was so petrified to actually share. And, and it was a group smaller than this. It wasn't even a large group. I was the type in college when you had to get up in front of like 10 people and say something, I'd freak out. I'd like have a meltdown. Evangelism, sharing my faith, talking with people about controversial subjects, talking with people, period. These were not my talents. These were not things that I could do. But what could I do? I could walk, I can put out a book, I can smile, and eventually I could say my name. I took what I had, and every day I used it for those 10 weeks in that summer. And by the end of those 10 weeks, what I realized is I still had what I started with, but I had developed so much, so much more. And then I took those things that I now developed, the new things, and I put those to work. And then I had the privilege to be an evangelist for the very first time. I was like 24 years old. I preached my first evangelistic campaign, prophecy seminar. Had no idea. I didn't even know how to make a PowerPoint presentation. So I did that. I took what little I knew, I put it to work, and God gave me so much more. And now... I have so many talents and capabilities and things, goods and gifts from God that I did not have 10, 15 years ago. But they were the result of putting to use the goods I had at the moment. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't my thing. But I put it to work. And by the way, this brings up a very good good point, very good side point. How many times have you said this phrase, oh, that's not my gift. That's not my talent. When someone comes to you and asks you to do something for your local church. Hey, we're going to go do this outreach program. Do you want to come put these flowers on doors? Oh, that's not my gift. That's not my talent. Hey, we're going to do this kids program. Can you help us to come at the kids program? Oh, kids? (laughs) That's not my gift. That's not my talent. Oh, we're going to do a health thing. Wait, did you say the word health? Healthy food? (laughs) Yeah, healthy food. That's not my gift. That's not my talent. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you said these types of things before? Oh, that's, that's not my area of specialty. Therefore, I'll let someone, someone else take care of it. And then no one shows up, right? <laughs> I'm going to challenge you, my friends, that as Christians, we should not actually say, that's not my gift, but to say, huh, that's a gift worth cultivating. Amen. Hey, that's not my talent. That's a talent worth cultivating. Okay, um, you want me to do what now? You want me to be a greeter. Okay, well, um, can, I, can I breathe? Yes. Can I smile? Yes. Can I speak? Yes. Can I speak to strangers? No. Okay, well, that would be hard. That would be something I'd have to cultivate. But I have the basics, therefore, let me put to work, work the basics and develop that skill over time. Amen? Amen? This is the beauty of the parable of the talents. This is what they're doing. They're taking what little they have, They're using it and developing so much, so much more. I promise you, people don't just like, they're not just like birthed into this world with all their capabilities already instilled within them. That's just not how it works. We develop over time, but we only could develop and grow if we put ourselves in the situation to grow. So again, we are called to multiply. Now in the parable, not everyone multiply their talents. You see, it says here in the Bible, but he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Why is it that we don't put to use the little that God has given us? What is it that holds us back in our personal experience from actually taking that step to put our talents to work, to put our talents to use? Often there are things that happen 
I believe, mindsets, perceptions that happen that cause this to take place. Can it be that we're afraid, yes or no? Of course. What can we be afraid of? Everything. <laughs> could, could we be afraid of failure? Yeah. What if you like try to greet and people are like, dude, that was like the worst greeter I've ever met. Like, how would you feel? You might be a little sad about that. Am I correct? Yeah. You know, I invited some people over and I was like, this were some college friends. I was like, hey, I'm gonna teach you guys how to cook some healthy food. It was like the most disgusting food I've ever made. Like, I mean, like we, I took a bite and I died. It was so salty, so nasty. And I looked at them, and they all, mm, I was like, no, no, mm, like, this is horrible. I'm buying us Thai food. We're throwing this away. Like, is there a risk when you try? Yes. What is the risk? Failure. But I believe some of us are scared of the opposite. Some of us aren't actually scared of failure. I believe a lot of us are actually scared of success. Because here's the thing. What if you do it, and it's good? Like, what if you tried, and it worked? What's the expectation? Yeah, we want more, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you pull off a good cooking school, guess what you're doing for the next year? Yeah, you're like locked in every quarter doing cooking schools. Like you're, you do an amazing kids program, guess what you're now, guess what you're the go-to person for? You're go-to for the kids program. You do that, you organize that evangelistic series, guess what? Man, you're now the like key organizer for all the outreach events. See, I think some of us are definitely afraid of failure, and that's very true, but I believe a lot of us are actually afraid of success. And I don't think we, sh we shouldn't be afraid of either, amen? Embrace it. Like, okay, yeah, you might fail. I couldn't say my name at a door. Trust me. I died of embarrassment. It happens. Life moves on, right? You keep moving forward, and guess what? I got my name down. You may try greeting, and you may not be that great of a greeter. You may struggle keeping the smile. You may struggle talking to people. It's like, yo, welcome. There's your seat. It's like, oh, okay, sure, thank you. You know, you go get the seat, and you're like, people are like, well, that was the weirdest thing ever, you know? But you keep trying, and you develop over time, and next thing you know, you're like the happiest, loveliest greeter there is because you learn how to interact with people, right? That only will come from actually getting out there and trying. I know some of us, man, we don't talk to strangers at doors. I get that. But guess what? You start knocking on some doors, start talking to some strangers, saying, hey, we have a cool cooking school. We have a soup kitchen. We have a kids program. We have a this, a that, and the other thing. You guys do wonderful programs at your local church. Go tell them, right? Go let people around here know the amazing things that you guys do. But someone's got to tell them, right? Who's that someone? Yeah, it's got to be you, amen? you got to go tell them. And yeah, you may mess up the first 20, 30, 40 times when you invite someone. That's okay. Eventually, you'll get it. Eventually, you'll cultivate and develop the skill. Sometimes we're afraid of success. Sometimes we're afraid of failure. My challenge is not to be afraid, but to embrace, to go out there and to grow, to develop something you don't currently have. You know, praise God for our people who sing special music. I don't think they came like, they weren't like, came out of the womb singing special music, amen? They cultivated that gift. They cultivated that talent. Praise the Lord that they did that. Because weren't you blessed by the special musics today? Praise God that they got out of their comfort zone many years ago and cultivated that gift so that you can be blessed today. Don't be afraid, my friends, because you have no idea what God has in store if we're just willing to go out there and put to use what little we have even if it's just the ability to smile and give someone a flyer. Ultimately, the parable does teach that God holds the stewards accountable for what they were given, for what they were given. There is a, a level of accountability involved. See, uh, verse 19 says, after a long time, the Lord of the servants came and settled accounts with them. See, he came to settle the accounts. He knows what he gave them, and he came almost like a bank balancer to say, okay, well, let's see how the account looks. So he had received five, came and brought five others, and saying, Lord, um, you delivered to me uh, five talents. Look, I have gained five more. Then he goes on to say, his Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over few. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He who had also received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What did you notice about the five and the two? 
They both invested. Yep, they both, they both invested. They both got returns. They both gave back to the master. And did the master tell them the same thing or different things? Same thing. Now, me being a human, worldling, in my mind, if I gave someone $500 and they brought me back $1,000, I'd be like, dude, you made me $1,000. Good job, man. You're hired, right? Gave a guy $200 and he brought me back $400. I'm like, okay, you did good too, but man, he made me 1000 Like, I mean, I'm kind of vibing the $1,000, right? But it's interesting. It doesn't matter how much you bring back. It's just the fact that you went and used what you had and brought something back. You could show up with 100 talents, you could show up with 10 talents, and God says the same thing, enter into the joy of the Lord. See, you may never get and acquire as many talents as your friend or your, the, the, you know, that other church member or an evangelist or whatever the case is. There may be certain gifts and talents that, you know, when, in, as you're, you know, you, when you're old in years and you look back on life, like, man, like, I, I, I've gained so much, I've grown so much, but there's so much more I could have grown in. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. His words are, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Yeah, you didn't cultivate 10. That's okay. You cultivated four. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get over here. Amen? The point isn't how many you cultivate. It's that you're living a life of cultivation. That's the distinction. How do you cultivate? By putting to work what you already, that's what, if you're living a life, putting to work what you have for the Lord, and what is the return? What is the investment? Souls for the kingdom. People knowing Jesus, the Lamb of God who loved them and died for them. As you put those talents to work to share the good news with all those around you, you will develop more. It's gonna happen. It's a law of nature, my friends. It's gonna happen. And as you develop more, you can put more, and as you put more, you develop more, and it's a life cycle of living that the Bible is calling us to. It goes on to say that he who had received the one came and said, Lord, I need to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here, you, uh, there, you have what is yours. So if I gave someone $100 and I came back and they said, hey, here's your $100, should I be content with that? Better than, better than losing it, right? Better than losing it. I like... Yeah, I like this part of the parable. I like the fact that he didn't lose any. I, I like the fact that he brought back what he was given. Here's why. It shows that the master was actually not concerned with the value. Because to get back what you gave is rightfully expected, correct? If I told you guard what I have given you, like you're a steward, stewards guard and protect. You're a steward, here's, here's a talent. And you said, hey, I hid it, I guard it, I protected it here's your talent back, you would think that that would be expected, that that would be good, that that would be what a steward should do. I like this part of the parable because it shows the point is not the value. The point is not the quantity of talents or lack thereof. The point is how you live your life. Doesn't matter the total quantity of talent, but are you putting what little you have to work for the master? That is the point of the, that's the main point of the talent. Are you taking what gift God has given you and putting it to work for the master? His Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. It's this idea that what was given was supposed to be put to work. It says, so take the talent from him and give to him who has 10, for to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, remember the context. This is about the second coming of Jesus. This is describing the condition of God's people right before Jesus returns. So what does the parable teach us? 
about the time period right before Jesus returns. There's two types of people in the church. Two types of people in the church. Those who are taking the goods and the talents God has given them and putting them to work for the master and those who are not. Those who are, they're doing it, again, remember, we have to back up a step here. They're doing it because they have that relationship with Jesus, amen? They're doing it out of that love for God. But the fact that they're having that experience is an evidence that that is the class of people ready for Jesus to return. The group that refuses is that who will not be ready when Jesus returns. See, it's a cute parable until we get to that point, amen? Then it just got real. Then we have to search our hearts and really ask ourselves, do I actually live a life of putting to use the gifts and the talents God has given me to better the community, to share the good news? Like, do I do that? Or am I the type who simply hides what I have so nothing can touch it? I don't want to use at all that which God has given me. Whether it's my time, my health, my ability to speak, my ability to smile, whatever it is. There are two glasses of people at the end of time. Those who are putting their talents to work for the master and those who are not. Now there's a parable that precedes this parable. And that's the parable of the wise and foolish versions, correct? I'll tell you what makes the distinction between the two because it sets you up for this parable. The distinction between the wise and the foolish versions is one thing. The wise know God and the foolish do not. That's it. The wise know God. They don't know about God. They know God. They have a daily relationship with him. They have an interpersonal relationship with him. You see, this is what it looks like, the three parables. The first one is an appeal to have a daily relationship with God through his word, to experience Jesus for yourself. The second one, the talents, describes how we are called to put to work out of a love for God, the gifts he has given us for those around us. And the sheep and the goat shows you what that looks like. Shows you what it actually looks like. How do you treat the poor, the prisoned, the sick? How do you treat those around you? So it's the three parables teaching one thought. Know God. Be willing to put yourself to work for the master with what little gifts you have from him. Cultivate more and live a life that impacts and serves those around you. That is the description of the church for those that are ready when Jesus returns. Those that do not have a daily relationship with Jesus, who don't put their talents to work for the master, and don't love and treat those around them with kindness and compassion like Christ would have. Give evidence that they are not ready for the return of Jesus. And the question is, the parable brings out, the ultimate conclusion of all three parables is, which one are? Which one are you? And if you find yourself a goat, not a sheep, that's okay. If you find yourself the one talent, not the ten talent, that's okay. If you find yourself the foolish and not the wise, that's okay, because you at least know, amen? And how do you remedy it? The remedy is super simple. Have a daily relationship with Jesus through his word. That is the remedy. That is the remedy. How do you know that you are daily having that experience? You will start to see fruit in these areas. If you don't see fruit in these areas, go back to the basics and be honest with yourself and with God. Do we actually have a genuine daily relationship or is it simply an academic experience? There is a difference, amen? Notice, I didn't say read your Bibles. I said have a relationship, time, communication, thinking, dwelling, experiencing, the ups and the downs, hand in hand with Jesus every day. Are you having that If not, nothing else will flow. But if you have that, these other areas will flow. So question, which one are you? Luke says, for everyone to whom much is given from him, much is required. God holds us accountable for the things that he has given us and how we use those to serve others and ultimately to serve 
him. He desires for us to put to use what little we have for the sake of all those around us. Our talents are supposed to be used to help prepare people for what? Yeah, the second coming of Jesus. That's the whole context. That, that's why the talents are being used so that people can know Jesus through you, however that may look. However that may look. Watch, therefore, the Bible says, for you don't know the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. You don't know. You don't know. I don't know. No one knows the day nor the hour. So the Bible doesn't call you to get ready right before the hour because no one knows the day nor the hour. The Bible calls you to live a different life. It calls you to a life cycle, my friends. A life of a relational walk with God. A life of actually getting involved in the church and the community and doing something for the master. Cultivating what little you have and developing so much more. And spending time with the sick, the oppressed, the widowed, the lonely, the brokenhearted. Spending time with them, loving on them, so that through you, they might find a God who loves them too. Amen? This is an experience. No one knows the day nor the hour. So the Bible never tells us, get ready right before. No, 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 no. It says, learn to walk with Jesus and to live a different life. A life that's not self-centered, but a life that's selfless. That cares more for others than it cares even for itself. And that cannot happen aside from the love of God within you. How many of you want to live like that? How many of you want to have that type of experience with Jesus that you might be found ready to stand when he returns? I want you to think about that question as you hear the words of this song. A stone to kill a giant, you took a staff to part the sea, and only you could do so much with ordinary things. You took a slave to tame a lion, you took a rock to make a spring, and only you would choose a shepherd boy to be a king. So I don't have to be the strongest, cause you are perfect in my weakness. If you can move a mountain with faith like a grain of mustard seed, I wonder what you could do with me. You're the God of all creation. You're the King above all kings. And only you would choose a rugged cross to rescue me. You're the healer of the broken. By faith I still believe. You took on my flesh, you conquered death. Lord, you are my victory. So I don't have to be the strongest. Because you are perfect in my weakness. Lord, if you can move a mountain with faith like a grain of mustard seed, I wonder what you could do with me. Open 
It doesn't take long to look outside to see that there are plenty that are suffering. There are plenty that are hurting. There are plenty that are sad. There are plenty who have so many things going on that they feel as if it just takes one more thing and it's gonna break. It's gonna, they're gonna snap. And often we think that and we pray, God, send us someone Send us that right preacher. Send us the Bible worker. Send us the team. Send us the souls west. Send us, send us, send, send us laborers, Lord. Because there is so much that needs to be done in our area, in our community, in our church. When we forget that often I believe we are the answer to our very own prayers. Like Isaiah, I believe when God gave the question, whom shall I send? We should give the same response he did. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Don't know how. Don't know, you know, don't know where exactly. Don't, don't know how it's going to work out. Don't, don't know what it's going to look like. But you know what, Lord? Here I am. Send me. You know that sign up list? There ain't no names on it. I'm going to put my name first. Never done it before in my life. Have no idea how, I didn't even know what, what we're doing. You know, when I first went door to door, I didn't know we actually sold the bookstore to door. We didn't know we left them on door. I, I had no idea. I thought we just like pray with people and gave them something. Like, oh, wait, we do what? Like, I actually got to like lead them to make a decision at the door. They're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, you're killing me right now. Like, I just want to be like, hi, read it, bye. You know, and I was like, I, I signed up and didn't fully know what I was even doing. But guess what? I did it. And I cultivated new, something new because of it. And my life has been nothing but cultivation after cultivation because I has not seen nor ear heard the wonderful things that the Lord has in store for you, Paul says. And I don't believe that's just for the new earth to come. I believe that's even for the earth present. You have no conception of what the Holy Spirit can do when you put yourself aside and just make room for Him to work. And you put yourself out there. You just throw yourself into the water and say, okay, Lord, help me swim. You know that's how I learned how to swim when I was a kid? I still remember. I was standing by the deep end, all jealous of everyone else that can swim. My dad said, do you want to know how to swim? I said, yeah, I want to learn how to swim. He said, awesome. Boom, and he threw me in the deep end. My mom was not too happy about it, but that's what he did. And guess where I popped out? popped out of the water kicking screaming i can swim didn't think it was possible but in the moment i realized man i wouldn't i would have never have jumped in i needed my dad to push me in a little bit hey look sometimes the lord is just going to stand behind you and start giving you some nudges don't resist just jump in the water amen be willing to get out there and to get uncomfortable Get uncomfortable for the Lord, because guess what? I guarantee Jesus was not comfortable when he was starving that day standing before the high priest. When he was tired and thirsty. 
when the Roman soldiers beat him and whipped him and bruised him, when his own disciples and best friends forsook him and left him, when he dragged a cross and fell on the ground and looked around and no one was willing to even help him, and hanging there naked upon the cross, everyone mocking and ridiculing, I guarantee Jesus did not feel comfortable, amen? But he did it for you. He did it for me. He allowed himself to be uncomfortable that he might save some, amen? Will you be uncomfortable for Jesus? I live a life of uncomfortability, my friends. <laughs> I always throw myself out there in uncomfortable situations. But I do it that by being uncomfortable, I might save some. I might help some. May not be my talent, may not be my gift. You know what? I was 30 something years old when God called me and I believe he said, hey, I want you to be a physician for me. I want you to go out there, start medical clinics in America. People do it, I want you to start an evangelism system in America that brings thousands to me who are broken and needing help right now. And I said, Lord, I'm getting old. I'm not old. I know that, trust me, trust me. But when it comes to medical school, you typically don't start when you're 35. That's just not how it works. I said, okay, Lord, you want me to go? I'll go. I signed up for community college. I sat there with 18-year-olds and I was like 33. They thought I was the teacher when they showed up. We're all standing out front. They said, Dr. Yamas, it's a pleasure to meet you. I said, oh, it's actually Mr. Baca. <laughs> not quite doctor, not quite Yamas, you know? So I was like, I I'm a student. And guess what? I had to go and be taught by 18, 19-year-olds at the tutoring center because I didn't understand chemistry. I had to sit there and have a kid tell me, okay, do you, do you understand this? No, I don't understand this. Okay, well, let me explain it again. And I got a kid telling me that I was a teacher of theology. I was the professor. I was an evangelist. People came to me for the I got a kid in front of me, man. I could have changed their diapers at one point. I'm just like, okay, you know? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. But knowing God called knowing God called, that tutoring center became a Bible study center by the end of that year. We had a group of Bible study. Yeah, we'd study chemistry, we'd study the health message, and then we'd study the Bible. Be uncomfortable for the Lord. Someone told me once when I was at the gym uh, with a personal trainer, and I started shaking, and I stopped the, the exercise. He said, why'd you stop? I said, oh, you know, I, I felt like I hit it. He's like, no, 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 no. When the shaking begins, it's when the growing begins. Until the shake, there's no growth. No growth at all. You grow when you shake. You grow when you're uncomfortable. You grow when there's a little bit of the pain. That's when you know you're growing. When you get out there and you feel uncomfortable, you should look up and praise God. Say, God, thank you. I'm uncomfortable. I know I'm growing now. I know I'm developing something new now because I'm uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, you look up and say, God, make me uncomfortable. Give me an uncomfortable thing to do. Because if I'm just comfortable every day, I'm not growing. I'm stagnant. I'm stale. I'm the one person hiding the talent in the ground. God. Make me uncomfortable for you that I might win some. How you want to do that, amen? God will let you, trust me. God, you, you be careful with your prayers. You be careful with those prayers because you don't got to be the strongest. You don't got to be the wisest. You don't got to be the fastest. You don't got to be the best. But you throw that prayer out there and you jump into the water, God will use you. Use the stone to take out a giant chose a shepherd boy to literally rule a nation. No one would have ever have thought about that. Question, what could God do with you in Ojai, Ventura, in the surrounding area, if you'll just dive into the water? Father, thank you for the chance to study your word. I pray for my friends. I pray that they would be inspired today. It's inspired to go out and to do something something different thank you for what they already do i know people here are already putting talents to work for you i know that many of us there are small groups here and there's different outreach programs there's a soup kitchen i thank you for for everyone here who is putting their talents to work but lord forgive us for getting comfortable forgive us for settling into a groove lord and just staying put forgive us for not holding the plank and diving into the deep end Give us courage. Give us faith and trust in you to take a step out and to do something we just don't normally do. 
that we might develop those talents, that we might maximize the gifts which you have given us. And that when we return with 50, 10, 2, whatever it is, we can hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, it only comes through a relationship with you. So help us to start there, to spend time with you, to fall in love with you through your word, that we would desire to share you with others, that we would desire to put our talents to work for you, that we would desire to take the things that we learn in our prophecy seminars and to share it with the world that does not know these things, that they might find a God of love who's ready to help them. Help that be us, Lord. Help us to answer the call like Isaiah did. Here I am. Send me. In Christ's name, amen. Stay.